بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له أن محمد عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم ركيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم من يتي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد ما dear brothers and sisters I bear witness that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his last messenger. Whoever Allah guides can never be led astray and whoever Allah leads astray can never find guidance. My dear brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, I am very grateful to be here once again with you to reflect on one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today I'd like to share with you some reflections on the attribute Malikul Mulk, which means King of Absolute Sovereignty. If we break this name down into Malik and Al-Mulk, we will recognize that there is some resemblance to another name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that name is Al-Malik. And the meaning of Al-Malik is owner or king. Al-Mulk means dominion or kingdom. And when we combine Malik Al-Mulk, it refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's absolute power over his dominion. In uh, the Quran, in several places, we are told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of the heavens and the earth. We find this in multiple places in the Quran. And one of those places is Surah An-Nur, where we are told, وَلِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَإِلَى اللَّهِ الْمَسِيرِ To Allah alone belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth. And to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the final return. And when we offer our salah, we recite Surah Al-Fatiha. And in this chapter, we are also reminded that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Maliki Yawm al-Din, master of the day of judgment. So Malik al-Mulk is not just ownership, it's the ability to do anything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to do with his creation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supreme over all of his creation. So for the next few minutes, let's try and understand the concept of ownership. When we make a purchase of a property, let's say, for example, uh, we purchase a golf ball. From the store. We might believe that because we paid for this golf ball, that we can do anything we want with it. And that would be a reasonable conclusion for us to reach about the golf ball. However, the moment we take that golf ball and we start throwing it at other people's home, we are now breaking a rule, a rule within our community and the rule that is part of our, uh, of our um, fabric of culture. And the rule says we can't cause harm to other people's property using the property that we have, which is that golf ball. So someone could come over to us and just take that golf ball away to stop us from doing any more damage, but also to tell us that this is not the right thing to do. So what are we gonna do then? Do we fight for a golf ball? Do we apologize for the damage we caused? You know, we could also be subject to fines in addition to paying for any damage we might have caused to the homeowners or the homeowner that we threw the golf ball uh, towards. So now let's replace the golf ball with the purchase of a home. So as a homeowner, we might think that this home that we purchased, the land that this home sits on, it's now ours to do whatever we please. And again, not an unreasonable conclusion to reach. What if we decide that on our property, we are going to experiment with materials that are toxic? So we have this home. It's sitting on a land that we've paid for as well. And now we're going to run some experiments using toxic materials. And if something goes wrong and our neighbors are harmed by our experiments, what happens to our home? Do we lose it to the local government because we cause harm to our neighbors? Or do we lose it to the toxic hazard we just created? Or maybe both. So while these examples are trivial, they are instructional for us. So what can we take away from these examples? They tell us that because we feel we are in control of ourselves, we can use our purchasing power to acquire things in this life. That level of empowerment is the level of control that we have within our lives. Now, how we operate 
within our daily lives is a different matter altogether. You know, we can just as easily lose the things we have to others because of our belief that we are in control. So what happens then when we lose that control? And that's the feeling of deep loss that we experience as human beings, as people. And we want to believe that we have agency over the direction our life takes because that helps us feel empowered. And we see this all around us. You don't have to look very far other than social media where that level of optimism is always present or seems to be the most present. Now, the truth of it all is that the life we're living today is temporary. We all know this, and this is not a secret. All that we have in our possession and all that we have access to is going to come to an end someday. If we believe otherwise, we are only fooling ourselves. So let's take another example. Let's think about the word king. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-Malik, let's see what we learn from this attribute. So to our understanding, a king is someone who has authority, someone who has power to compel people to do his bidding, to do their bidding. A king is someone who sociologists would call someone in possession of given authority. There's earned authority, and then there's given authority. So king has um, mostly given authority. So king also needs a kingdom because, you know, what is a king without a kingdom? He doesn't have a dominion to control or to impress that power over. So the kingdom is a territory, a state, or a country over which a king presides. Within this kingdom, a king can create rules, any number of rules, without anyone else needing to approve them prior. So the king could make up a rule and declare the law of the land at any moment. And the people who live in that kingdom are automatically subject to the rules of the kingdom. And then, of course, the king would have people who would implement or enforce those rules. So this level of autonomy and agency for a single person to have is extremely powerful. And at a very base human level, we all desire that level of agency and that level of autonomy, our desire to do whatever we want. And that demonstration of control can easily fool a person to believe that they are the ultimate authority, especially if they are the king. And that they can decide the fate of every subject within their dominion that has taken residency. So it gives, it gives a person in that position an extreme sense of superiority. So if we take the golf ball example from earlier and we say that, okay, the king throws the golf ball at the homes of his subjects, what would then become of a king? Probably nothing. So if you and I threw the golf ball, there's a different consequence. But if a king threw that uh, golf ball, there would be probably no consequence. So the king is, in effect, the supreme authority in that kingdom. So unlike the golf ball, which can be purchased in a store, the, a king can't just go out and purchase a kingdom. The kingdom and the title of being king has to be given. And anything of this magnitude can only be given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amongst many other blessings. And everything we do have in our possession comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this trivial example is just a small thought experiment for us to recognize that even a king, an arguably powerful individual, does not have absolute sovereignty because absolute sovereignty is the exclusive domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Malikul mulk. So how do we know that kingdoms are given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We also know this from the Quran, but my dear brothers and sisters, you know, in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, we learn about a interaction, about an interaction that Abraham or Ibrahim al-Islam had with one of the disbelieving kings or the disbelieving king of Babylon at the time named Namrud or Nimrod. And in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, you know, are you a prophet not aware of the one who argued with Abraham about his Lord because Allah had granted him kingship. In this interaction, Ibrahim salam reminds Nimrod to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the kingdom and power Nimrod was enjoying over such large territories was because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abraham is spreading the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a disbelieving king. And instead of submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Nimrod feels a sense of entitlement and power like anybody in his position would. And he challenges Ibrahim al-Islam. He challenges Ibrahim to present a proof of the existence of God. 
So what does Ibrahim salam say to Nimrod or Nimrud at this time? He says, Rabbil lazi yughi wa you meet. Rabbil lazi yughi wa you meet. My Lord is the one who has power to give life and cause death. And Nimrod, a foolish um, king of his time, takes the position and believes himself to be God. And what does he say back to Moses when Moses says that Allah is the one who gives life and causes death? Nimrod says, Ana, oh ye wa meet. I too have the power to give life and cause death. Extreme arrogance from the part of Nimrod. And believing himself to possess absolute sovereignty by saying that I too have the power to give life and cause death. He believed that by setting a person free who is punished for death or whose uh, punishment is to um, be, uh, be hung or to be killed for whatever crime they must have done, that that ability makes him a god because he can pardon that person and he could also cause the death of that person by simply taking the life of them at any time. And this, arrogant made, this arrogance made him believe that he was God. So at this point, Ibrahim salam, has a clear picture that this is not someone who understands the nature of what does it mean to give life and what does it mean to cause death. So Ibrahim salam, presents a beautiful argument. He says to Nimrod, Allah causes the sun to rise from the east, so make it rise from the west. And at this point, Namrud is dumbfounded at Abraham's statement. And he has no response for Ibrahim alayhi salam. Why? Because he knows that there is no way for him or anyone else in his kingdom or even the world to cause the sun to rise from the west. In one of the tafsirs or the commentary of uh, this verse, uh, it was mentioned that uh, Nimrod understood that if he countered this argument or this statement from Ibrahim a.s., if he said to Ibrahim a.s., ask God to raise the sun from the west, this would have caused his people to revolt against him and he would have consequently lost all of his kingdom or everything that he had in his possession. And, and what's the argument there? Because at that point, in that moment, Nimrod recognized that the creation of the sun and rising of the sun from the east is proof of the divine. Once you've established that there is proof of God, that God exists, it only stands to reason that God can cause the sun to rise from the west if Ibrahim salam had asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this miracle. Therefore, making this statement would actually undermine him and his authority. So even after the truth was made clear to Nimrod, even after understanding and realizing that there is a divine authority, there is an authority, a power that is supremely magnificent over all creation, he refused to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now contrast this example of a disbelieving king with one who has the same blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, given the title of king, given large territories to manage and the miraculous ability to speak with animals. And that is Suleiman or Solomon. So Suleiman was a believing servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was always grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the gifts that he had received. And from the story of Suleiman in the Quran, we learned that we must always be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what we have. And not just feel grateful, but also ask Allah for inspiration to always be grateful. And we also learn that doing good deeds alone is not just enough. We also need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good deeds. So do the good deed and then ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this good deed from us. So we learn from Surah Naml, for example, where uh, Sulaiman al-Islam makes this dua and it's a beautiful dua. Rabbi awzitni an ashkuru ni'mataka latin an amtu my Lord, inspire me to always be thankful for your favors, which you have blessed me and my parents with, and to do good deeds that please you. Admit me by your mercy into the company of your righteous servants. And this prayer of Sulaiman 
is one that is, uh, for me at least, a reminder to always, always, always act with gratitude, feel that blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always accept our good deeds. And inshallah, may Allah accept and elevate our du'as and elevate our understanding of the Quran. And, you know, may we all live in the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I'd like to remind myself first, and then all of you watching and listening, that we will all return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There will come a day when everything will be revealed to us, and we will be reminded of what we used to do. And on that day, there will be no injustice. On that day, there will be no regret except for what we could have done more of in this world. And that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on that day, there will be no sorrow except for our actions that do not measure up to what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on that day, there will be no desire other than to find ourselves in Jannah, surrounded by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the other righteous servants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجْعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً If Allah had willed, He would have made you one community, making all of mankind into a single community that follows the same rules is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that we all come from different cultures, upbringings, and worldviews should tell us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to teach us all something through our differences. And our differences are an opportunity to learn from one another. And learning can happen for us through peaceful discourse on one end of the spectrum to violent interactions on the other end. And how we choose to bring ourselves to align with our creator is not only a struggle for us as individuals, but also a struggle for our various communities too. And we live in a time when our differences are given more emphasis than what is common to us all, which is our humanity. You can pull up social media, you can pull up the, the news, you can pull up the, the newspapers as well. There are more highlights of the differences between people, what causes us to, to have strife amongst ourselves, than there is any emphasis on trying to find ways to bring us together as one humanity. And in Surah Al-Ma'idah, you know, we're also told the story of Cain and Abel, or Qabil and Hawil in Arabic, um, who were the two sons of Adam al Islam. And when the two sons, uh, Cain and Abel, offered a sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Cain's offering was not accepted, and Abel's offering was accepted. And this angered Cain, and that prompted Cain to kill Abel. And Abel warned him before this incident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the offering of those who have taqwa, that is fear of Allah or God consciousness. And the verse that follows this story is the word, the verse that a lot of us already know and, and we hear about, at least since 9-11, this is the verse that's been talked about the most, which is whoever takes a life, it will be as if they killed all of humanity. And this is in verse 32 of Surah Al-Ma'idah, which is chapter 5. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean by all of humanity? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to teach us through the story of Cain and Abel that when Cain took Abel's life, Cain didn't just kill one person. Okay, Allah wants to set, give us an example that killing that one person was like killing all of humanity. But let's understand what does all of humanity mean. So taking Abel's life, Cain destroyed all future generations that would have been born under Abel. So think about that. The blood of many generations is spilled by the murder of one person. Now let's think about in the world we live in today. We have some crises in the Muslim community today. Every single life lost. Every single life lost. Imagine the many generations that could have been from each and every one of those lives. It's heartbreaking to even begin to fathom, even if you can begin to fathom what that would be like. So Allah reminds us that وَلَا كِلِّ his will to test you, his will is to test you with what he has given each of you. And each of us have something that we can give and something that we can share with others as well as use for ourselves, whether it's our strength, our knowledge, 
whether it's wisdom that we have, may have gained in the profession that we are in, whether it is you know wealth that we've accumulated over time, you know this is a reminder for us to recognize that we all depend on Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is Malik al Mulk, the Kingdom, the King of Absolute Sovereignty, and it is only Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that we have to thank for this. Sheikh Ibn Taala in his book uh, Kitab al Hikam or the Book of Wisdoms, he tells us. So long as you are in this world, be not surprised at the existence of sorrows. For truly, it manifests nothing but what is in keeping with its character. And what Sheikh Ibn Tala is reminding us is that, you know, don't be surprised by the difficulties and misfortunes and the sorrow we witness in this world. That is the characteristic of this world. This world is made up of trials and tribulations. And that is in line with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran. That Allah's will is to test us with what we have. And it is a place where beauty and filth can be found everywhere. Why? Because Allah wants to see how we distinguish ourselves between those who are patient and those who are impatient. And to distinguish between those who are grateful and those who are ungrateful. And each and every one of us are caretakers of not just our lives, but also have rights and responsibilities that we need to cater to for our communities, for our loved ones, parents, brothers, sisters, our children, spouses, etc. And our knowledge, our wealth, our status in society, and anything else we can think of that is a blessing for us, we are caretakers and custodians of that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we carry the arrogance of Nimrod in our hearts, then we will certainly find ourselves from among the people of the hellfire. And if we carry ourselves with gratitude like Suleiman alayhi salam, then we will find ourselves in the mercy of the King of Absolute Sovereignty. Inshallah, may Allah accept all of our good deeds and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our hearts towards Him. In al Muslimina wal Muslimat, wal Mu'minina wal Mu'minat, wal Qanitina wal Qanitat, wal Sadiqina wal Sadiqat, wal Sabirina wal Sabirat, wal Khashi'ina wal Khashi'at, wal Mutasaddiqina wal Mutasaddiqat, wal Sa'imina wal Sa'imat, wal Hafizina furujahum wal Hafizat, wal Zakirina Allaha kathiran wa Zakirat. عد الله لهم مغفرة وعجر عظيمة ربنا حب لنا من أزواجنا وزورياتنا كرة تعيون وجعلنا المتكين إماما ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر أننا سيئاتنا وتوافنا مع الأبرار رب جعلني مكيم الصلاة ومن زورياتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوحاد ربنا عليك توكلنا وعليك نأبنا وعليك المصير ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا إنك أنت العزيز الحكيم ربنا آمنا فاغفر لنا وارحمنا وأنت خير الراحمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون والسلام للمرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم آمين آمين آمين